This is just a sample of the training available at ITDVDs.com. To see complete training, please go to ITDVDs.com. Let's begin the sample. With a failover cluster, the goal is to keep an application up and running at all times. So if we have a hardware failure or something like that, the clients that are connecting to that clustered application, that failover cluster, don't even know that there was a problem. They can continue working and there is no interruption. So that's the goal. To accomplish it, we have something called nodes in our cluster. Here we have a two-node cluster, and the nodes are just the servers that are in our cluster. If we had a five-node cluster, we'd have five servers. And on our nodes, we install Windows Server 2012 R2 and the application we're trying to cluster. So if we're trying to cluster a file server, we would install the file server role on each one of our nodes. If we're trying to cluster a SQL server, for example, we would install SQL server on each one of our nodes. So the application files are going to be on every node. And then we have something called shared storage. Shared storage is going to be accessed by all of our nodes. So they can all see this shared storage and that's where the files or the data that the clustered application is using are going to be held. So if we're clustering a file server, then the file share is actually going to be on this shared storage. If we're clustering SQL Server, then the database files are actually going to be on this shared storage. That what, that's what makes it possible if we have a failure, let's say node A goes down, for the application to run on node B because we already have the application installed on the disks internal to this server and then it connects to that shared storage where the data is held so like the database files or the file share now you might be wondering well how do the clients know to connect to node A when node A is called the the active node meaning that the clustered application is running on it well they use a virtual name and a virtual IP address. So this is different than virtual machines. It doesn't have anything to do with that. What it is, it's a name and IP address that can be owned by any node. And the node that owns it is called the active node. The node that doesn't own it is called the passive node. The passive node is just waiting for a failure to occur and to take over this virtual name and IP address. So the clients use this virtual name, let's say cluster 01, it translates this IP address if node A owns it, then they connect to node A. So they don't actually type in node A, they type in cluster 01. When a failover occurs, so node A goes down, fails over to node B, and node B owns cluster 01, since they're using that virtual name to connect, they automatically get routed to node B. So that's what makes it possible for the clients, in the event of a failure, to be able to automatically connect to the active node, the node where the application failed over to. So in a traditional failover cluster, we have storage that we've created. Let's say we're calling it the E drive. When node A is active, it will be the one to read and write to the E drive. In the event of a failure to node B, node B will then read and write to the E drive. And the E drive won't be accessed by the passive node. So if node A is the passive one, then it won't access the E drive, just the active node. And of course, that E drive is the data that the application is using, and that's held on our shared storage. So with Windows Server 2012 R2, and this is actually introduced with Windows Server 2008 R2, we have something called clustered shared volumes. Clustered shared volumes allow both nodes to be active. So instead of being having an active-passive scenario, we have active-active so that both nodes are reading and writing to that clustered shared volume, which is storage on our SAN normally, or our SAS array. So that's something new with Windows Server 2000. Well, it's new with Windows Server 2008 R2, but it's kind of new to Windows Server 2012 and 2012 R2 in that we're going to use it for more than just Hyper-V. Before we used it for Hyper-V, now we have something called a scale-out file server where we, our file server can be active-active. So we'll, we'll see that. Also, our, virtual, our, our nodes can be virtual machines. So in a traditional failover cluster, we normally have these be physical machines. We can make them virtual machines. And we can even go a step further and have our shared storage actually be a virtual disk. So we're going to see that as well. But the bottom line is the concepts are all going to remain the same. We're going to have clients that are going to connect to our cluster. We're going to have nodes in our cluster. And we're going to have shared storage. 
Now we're also normally going to have a couple different types of networks. We may have a few more. Of course, we may have a few less as well. But in general, we have a public network. This is the network that the clients are going to use to access the clustered application. So if it's SQL Server, if it's a file share, we're going to use the public network to access it. We've got a heartbeat network. This is what our cluster nodes are going to use to communicate back and forth to each other and say, hey, are you up or are you down? So that's how they know to fail over. And then we normally have some type of storage network. If it's iSCSI, this is going to be an Ethernet network. If it's fiber channel, it's going to be a fiber network. This would be a fiber switch. If this is a SAS array, these are going to be SAS cables that are directly connected from node A to the SAS array to node B to the SAS array. So those are the basic concepts of a failover cluster and how it works. We're going to get to see all the different scenarios now that we have with Windows Server 2012 R2 clustering.